On the surface, the life of Christian musician Steve Green seems picture perfect. He was born the son of missionaries, attended Christian schools, sang for Christian bands, and launched his own music ministry in 1983. But there was a time when an internal struggle raged between the Steve Green everyone saw on stage and the Steve Green only Steve knew. God, I give up. For 10 years, I've been uh, doing a tug of war with you. I've been wanting my own way, but um, I don't know you, I don't love you, I don't think I anything you. There's a story to be told of every life made new. A testimony to God's grace and the love he has for you. Though the stories may be different, the tie that binds stays the same. A tapestry of life. Held together by the hand of God With the eternal bread of Christ Four years old, uh, when my parents uh, moved five children down to South America First stop was Costa Rica, where they went to language school to learn Spanish And then on to Argentina My parents were located in the very northern three provinces uh, of Argentina is where we worked 13 years that I, that I was there. Lived in the very northern province called Salta in a small town called Tartagal. Living in Argentina was of course a, a big culture shock for us uh, coming from the United States and moving down there. My dad was great at coming up with ideas to gather a crowd so he could preach and uh, there were times when he'd have us set up on some street corner and start playing clarinet and my brother played a trumpet and my other brother a guitar. And people looked at us as, you know, I don't know, kind of like a freak show. We, they'd never seen anything like it. Three white, you know, blonde <laughs> kids playing instruments. They'd never seen a clarinet or a trumpet. I mean, the native instruments were very different than that. People would just come and as a crowd gathered, then my father would, would preach the gospel. Sometimes rocks would be hurled at you from the back or people would say things like, go home, Yankee, or other other names that weren't so nice. And I think in that context, as brothers, we hung together pretty closely. I saw in my father and mother's life a genuine love for Christ and a genuine love for the people. It wasn't just a professional missionary doing work. Uh, it was very real. I suppose the greatest example of it to me was the way that they loved. Well, that had a very profound impact on me. Like most missionary children, I was sent off to boarding school with Steve and my oldest brother and sister. I remember just sobbing, uh, looking out the window as my parents drove off. I'm sure it broke their heart as well. Um, in those days, it was the only option that they had. That first year of, of the boarding school, during one of the nap times on Sunday afternoon, I was reading a Sunday school paper that they'd given to me and it gave the missionary story on there. I read it and for the first time, realize, you know, I've never done this. I've never personally um, said, Lord, forgive me, and I need you as my Savior. So I knelt down by the bed and, and prayed that. I went out to the playground afterwards and told the kids, hey, guess what I just did? <laughs> I just, I, gave, I became a Christian. <laughs> it was an eight-year-old confession of faith. You know, the next years were still years in a boarding school, hard years. All kinds of changes happening emotionally, physically, and who do you talk to? Who do you ask? I came back to the States to start high school, and that was a thrill for me. I mean, back to the homeland, uh, it was, I'd been looking forward to this for a long time. Uh, everything was different. Uh, wide, clean roads, big, shiny cars, uh, shopping centers, grocery stores packed. Everything was different. It was unbelievable. It looked like the whole country was Disneyland to me. Lived here for a couple years, then went back to South America at age 16, right before my 16th birthday, taken back out of the promised land just before I got my driver's license. All my friends were getting ready to get their own cars and work and all this, and I'm taken back to South America. I think that was really the beginning of... Uh, some resentment. Um, you know, it's one thing when you're eight, it's more of a hurt, but when you're 16, um, it, it, I think, uh, turns into seeds of 
resentment and bitterness. And uh, I almost felt like I was, I was a captive. Steve began in those years to really desire to be more of an American than an Argentine. And I think his heart began to really move towards the States and away from the people there. And I think developed maybe in his heart a, the attitude that you know, once I leave here, I'm not coming back. That hardness uh, grew and lasted for 10 years until I was 26. That's a long, dry, wandering period. And during that period, lots of things happened. I eventually came back to the States, enrolled in college. He picked me up in a car, and he was pretty cool. I was pretty impressed. He was driving and uh, had the windows down, the radio on, and he was pretty much all American at that point. Uh, traveled with uh, a music group. What is this coming out of your mouth? <laughs> singing some big notes and singing loud. We were surprised by the ability that he had. We didn't know that he had that kind of voice. We were, I think, all a little bit shocked. Met my wife. I remember he was shy, very shy when I first met him. And so shy that it almost kind of took me back. I was married, ended up working with the Gaithers. We are we so a lot happened in that 10 year span uh, that actually was laying the foundation and groundwork for what I do today, uh, musically, uh, but I was still in a wasteland spiritually. I was Christian externally, meaning, um, you know, I still went to church, but that was about it, really. And, and even when I was involved in music, uh, it was more music than anything else. I would say I was a voice for hire. Uh, I sang because I was paid to. Add marriage to that, and from outside appearances, it looked like we had a good marriage. I thought we had a good marriage. I guess you're blind a little bit. You don't realize in what condition you're in until, you, until it changes, and you realize where, you know, that really was nothing compared to what it is now. There was not the spiritual union that is so necessary for the bonding of a real whole marriage. We were both singing back up for the Bill Gaither Trio on the weekends, and it was a good life. I thought it was a good life. I had no idea what was going on in his private life. If I'm not a captive by Christ, then I'm going to be, in some degree or another, captive to sin, to my own passions and, and desires. And that's where I was. Into that situation, um, God sent my older brother, Randy. He had just been through uh, uh, his own personal revival experience. We were all converging on Phoenix for my sister's wedding, and he picked me up at the airport, and I, I could tell immediately something's different. God was just burdening my heart to tell them what God had done in me and what I felt he wanted to do in their lives as well. I told them very specifically areas where there had been sin in my life and bondage and how Christ had set me free. He's concerned about our lives and exhorting us to get right with God. And he began to cry, and it was very emotional. And this, I mean, this was not the Randy we knew. And how the Holy Spirit had gotten a hold of my heart in a way that I'd never experienced. I'm thinking, man, what happened to this guy? You know, this is really weird. And for the next three days, that's all he did. And uh, over the course of that time, um, I began to grow resistant to him. I resented him getting in everyone's face and talking about God. You know, you could talk about God for a while, but not all the time. That's, that's not normal, see. Came to a head when we were in a car. I couldn't get away, and he started his rampage again, you know. Uh, the days are, are short. Uh, you've got to be right with God. Uh, the only thing that counts is living for Christ, you know, on and on. And uh, just something inside of me welled up in anger against him. Coming up, find out how Steve's confrontation with his brother changes his life forever. I ended up that night on my knees saying, uh, God, I give up. And later, how God gives Steve a new direction in his music career. Then a strange thing happened. There, there was the formation of a life message 
when testimony, profiles, and faith continues. You're watching Steve Green on Testimony, Profiles, and Faith. So we were in the car, and Randy just started in talking about the Lord again. I just felt burdened to share with them what the Spirit of God was, was doing in my life, and maybe uh, exhorting them also to, to really uh, seek the Lord and to really surrender their lives to the Lord. And I think Steve had had it just about up to here. It got to the point where I told him to just shut up. Stop, shut up. And uh, he started crying. There was hostility and antagonism, and yet I knew immediately in my heart that that, that wasn't against me. It was against the Holy Spirit. And so I, I said to Steve, Steve, you're not resisting me. You're resisting the Holy Spirit. I said, and you are a liar. I said, what do you know about my life? What right do you have to make any judgment about my life? He said, I don't know what it is, but there's something wrong with you. All I ask is that you get it right. And it got quiet in the car, and the presence of God was there in a powerful way. Steve really began to search his heart, really openly and honestly before God to see if he needed revival. I ended up that night on my knees saying, uh, God, I give up. Uh, for 10 years, I've been uh, doing a tug of war with you. I've been wanting my own way. Um, I've been a blatant hypocrite. Uh, I, I figured out all the church stuff, the things you say, uh, the way you act, but um, I don't know you, I don't love you, I don't think I anything you. God really arrested Steve at that point. Um, he was going about his own business, living his life, and all of a sudden he came face to face with somebody who confronted him about his own walk with the Lord. I woke up that morning thinking I was a top dog. And by the end of the night, I was smashed. And God did it. He smashed me. But it's the best thing in the world. Um, and unless he'd done that, I would have self-destructed. I would have ruined my life. I could have lost my family. Who knows where I would have gone. But I was an arrogant fool. And God saved me. The first thing that changed was a desire to be right through and through. Not to have the just the visible part and then a hidden invisible part but for there to be unity meaning I want to be right with God to the depths of my being and so for two and a half weeks um, I went to people that I had wronged or relationships that were damaged he had to make restitution to a lot of people and share with me some real difficult things that were hard for me to hear and God enable me to forgive and it was like God was cleansing him and preparing him for something far greater than he had no idea what was ahead of him. And all of a sudden his, his whole posture and attitude went from somebody who was really pretty self-confident and had a talent and knew it to somebody who was really humble and somebody who really wanted to see God work and God do things in people's lives. And then a strange thing happened. There, there was the formation of a life message. I'd be sitting in concerts, and they weren't even my concerts. I'm just a backup singer, and I'm looking out at the audience. I want to talk to them. I want to tell them some things. But I don't even, there, it's not my place to do that. And so all these things were changing, and I said, you know, God, what am I going to do with this stuff? Shortly after that, I was having a meeting. It was a, actually a, a vocal band meeting. And Bill walked in and said, Gloria got up this morning and said, I don't think Steve's going to be with us much longer. I said, really? I said, well, what do you think, Bill? He said, well, I think she's right. And he said to me, what do you think? I said, well, I think she's, maybe she's right also. <laughs> and, that was, and that was it. Should I stay in music? Should I not? What should I do? I don't know what to do. And Gloria was the one that really said, now it's right. Now the music has the right perspective. So we started, oh my goodness, how do we start? Um, I was determined that this would be something that God built, not man-made. And a sweet lady, 
offered to help do some scheduling for me. And yet I said, I don't want you to make any cold calls and I don't want you to send out any literature. She said, well, how the, how's anyone going to know who you are? I said, I don't know, <laughs> but let's try it like this. And so far, see, God has been doing it in spite of us. Let's just see if, if he'll do it some more. We would get in our little car and travel all the way from Nashville to North Carolina or South Carolina and sing for 25 people and drive all the way back. And we didn't care because we had each other and we had the Lord. That's all that mattered. And yet, it was glorious. I mean, God met us, even if it's only 35 of us at a, at a little concert. <laughs> it was wonderful. My primary message was the sum total of, of where I had come from and the passion with which God had changed my life and now a desire to talk to people that were just like what I was. It was actually at Liberty College and I was back there running sound in those days, if you can believe that. And he just began to share and I just looked at him like, who is this person? I cannot believe, this is not the same man I've known. And it was just with an authority and a boldness and a, and a humility that he hadn't seen before. People just started coming to the altar and weeping, college guys just weeping before the Lord. I wept back at the sound, the sound booth. I could not believe that this was happening. We had a, our marriage together. Mary Jean and I were deeply in love. And we had the Lord. God was meeting us at all these little concerts. And our little daughter, who was just barely one. We had everything we needed. We didn't miss a meal. It was extraordinary. That's all that mattered to us. And I thought, what else could a guy ask for? What else could you possibly want than this? And it was from that point that everything else came. It would be so easy for him to get off track and think that, you know, what's happened to me has happened by my own hands. But God has, you know, lovingly kept him at a place where he's very dependent on the Lord. And he knows where his strength comes from. I stand on a platform. I'm a little bit removed uh, from the nitty gritty of people's lives. I sing songs. I say some things, I speak, um, they clap, um, we pray, and they all go home. And I get on a bus and I go someplace else. And if I'm not careful, I can have a very detached life from reality, from the nitty gritty. And I don't want that. Coming up, hear how Steve keeps his Christian walk real. Being a part of the vital work of God in my community and later how Steve sees God's impact in his life. God has been the glue that has held my life together. When Testimony, Profiles, and Faith continues. You're watching Steve Green on Testimony, Profiles, and Faith. I need something genuine. I think the genuine gives, gives you authenticity. And so I need it, in many ways, I need it uh, with my family. I want my family to be a real family. So I want us to be involved in the lives of real people. I want my life to be accessible to people. I want to be involved in my local church. Steve came to us, and of course, I've known him for years through the church. We've been church mates, but he really began, I think, a conviction towards racial reconciliation and desiring to work with the poor. And he and his brother together, I think, began to say, you know, what kingdom are we really building? Is it the Steve Green ministry or is it the kingdom of God? The Empty Hands Fellowship has been meeting for two years, just over two years, in a McDonald's here in Franklin, Tennessee. The reason for the meeting is to, to interact cross-racially, cross-denominationally as a group of Christian pastors and lay people. 
and also cross-culturally. We give testimonies, we, we praise God for the things that he's doing uh, in our midst. And so, but then on, on Thursday, it's, it's a lot more serious time. Uh, we meet together specifically for prayer. Uh, we don't do anything else. We just come and ask, ask God, invite God in to our presence. God has knitted us together, so I, I think He is the, the reason. What He's done in drawing us together, He has given us all the same vision, the same understanding. When they go and see Steve in a concert, they see Steve, the musician. But when He comes in our midst, we see Steve, a brother in God. God's principle, as stated in Psalm 32, is that if we continue to cover ourselves, He is determined and bound to uncover us. He doesn't want to humiliate us. And so he gives lots of opportunities to come clean, to come to the light. That's part of where vital relationship comes in. Uh, I've had tremendous friendships with men, uh, some artists, some leadership at our church. Uh, it's easy to confess to God, but I think that he calls us uh, often to another level, and that is uh, before one another. I think the thing that I've learned from Steve's life is that if you if you sing Christian songs, you know it's fine to have a great voice and, and to well-engineered mu music and all that sort of stuff. But beneath that, the most important thing is that you validate what you sing by the way you live. That's the thing I've learned from Steve. He is a, he really makes those songs uh, believable and beautiful by the way he lives. You know, I can sit here today and look back with a sense of tremendous gratitude because God has been the glue that has held my life together. He has literally been my life, my reason for living, um, making sense out of everything, uh, giving uh, also a, a, a deep satisfaction and fulfillment in relationships, my home with my wife. And it isn't just uh, some conjured up spirituality, it has to be a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And uh, the Lord is, is uh, certainly, over the course of these years, uh, been my reason for living. Take away everything else. If it all were to crumble tomorrow, I have Him, and He's enough. There's a story to be told of every life made new. A testimony to God's grace love he has for you though the stories may be different the tie that binds stays the same a tapestry of life held together by the hand of god with the eternal bread of christ